Uh, for more analysis on these market moves, I want to bring in uh, David Banson, of course, uh, Chief Investment Officer at the Banson Group, which has $2.5 billion in assets under management. David, let's start off with, uh, I guess you could call this a rotation trade. Uh, is that what's happening here? Yes, but again, it's really been happening for some time now. I think this began going into the fourth quarter, and that overall rotation idea has got a couple different themes to it. It's had the growth into value. It's had the laggards from COVID taking over from some of the leaders during COVID. But that overall rotation is very much thematic in markets right now. Rotation, does that mean... Small caps is where it's at, David. Does it mean it's cyclicals where it's at? And how much is it sort of predicated on, well, COVID not steaming the line light once again and being the key concern for the market? I would have said until recently that it was anything that had lower valuations that were getting caught up. It was a sort of reversion to the mean trade. And that was affecting all the examples you gave, small cap, value, cyclicals. Small cap, though, has now gotten quite frothy as well, but that's just because of the violence of the rally, which has sort of brought it back in line. And you think about how small cap went down more than big cap during the COVID crash last uh, March, April, and then recovered to actually finish the year stronger than the S&Ps. So I think that small cap's gotten a bit expensive, but the value side, the cyclical, and, and really those sort of COVID losers, which is where energy, financials come in, all of them are much more expensive than they were, obviously, but nobody could look at the valuations historically and say, oh, this space looks crowded or this space looks overvalued. It's still sort of unloved, and it's definitely a more compelling value than the 25 times you see in the S&Ps and the 35 times you see in the NASDAQ. Talk to me about those valuations. Our last guest, Bingy Chata, Deutsche Bank, noted valuations, two standard deviations above fair value. Where are you then on valuations? Well, that's accurate, but of course that's being compared to a historical period with a 5 or 6% on the 10-year and a 3 or 4% on the Fed funds rate. So although I don't think that we can use the Fed as an excuse for excessive valuation forever, I think that actually large cap growth trades more on a trajectory of interest rates than it does the level of rates. But the fact of the matter is that the standard deviations that are out of whack right now valuation wise, it's, it's still comparing to some degree an, apples to an, an apple to an orange. Yeah. I think that, that when you have a Fed funds rate at zero, it justifies a little higher valuation. But at some point, that comes back to bite. And that's what I think investors need to pay attention to, is that they are adding risk to the portfolio when they continue to pile on to some of those trades. Frankly, some of them being things that have paid them quite handsomely already, it makes perfect sense to keep equity exposure, to keep risk in the portfolio, but to recalibrate it around things that might have less volatility and certainly more reasonable entry valuations that's where a lot of these financials, energy, and there's other sectors too. Consumer staples are not overpriced to the same degree some of the other sectors are. I wouldn't call them cheap. Yeah. Utilities, materials, they're still flat out cheap. So there's plenty of opportunity out there outside of big cap technology. All right, speaking here with David Bonson, Chief Investment Officer at the Bonson Group. David, I am curious about your thoughts on some individual stocks here, specifically with Intel, which I know you guys are involved in. Um, what is the case right now for Intel? Well, it really is a phenomenal technology company that I think became too much of a financial engineering M&A, trying to, to, they were basically in a difficult position in the cycle fighting some secular headwinds. There was a very gifted CEO, but he was more of a financier. And I think this new CEO hire is a technology guy. In fact, of course, was the CTO at Intel itself over 10 years ago. Um, I, I don't know if Dan Loeb and this activist uh, endeavor are going to go anywhere beyond this, but pursuing this idea of strategic reorganization, separating the design and the chip manufacturing, it's intriguing to us. What we care about is building shareholder value through free cash flow mm. generator businesses. And Intel has always been a huge cash flow generator and, um, of course, a very generous dividend payer. And that's what we are, dividend mm. growth investors. We love the Intel Dividend. story, and it's gotten a great start to the year. 
What about the story of M&A for a bank like JP Morgan? I know it's another one that you like, and there's an interesting call coming from Odeon today, Dick Bove over there, saying, look, we're going to see JP Morgan making some big bets and big acquisitions, could even buy non-banks, even Target. Where are you thinking that JP Morgan and Jamie Dimon is going to put the money to work? Well, I think that J.P. Morgan, first of all, is going to make money in M&A advising others on their M&A. We think there's going to be a big <laughs> resurgence of M&A throughout 2021, and J.P. Morgan as a premier investment banker will be right there in that. But as far as their own M&A, I have to remind people that the smartest M&A J.P. Morgan ever did is when they were getting businesses virtually for free in the aftermath of the financial crisis. And I think that when you're pillaging the, the Bear Stearns and Washington Mutuals of the world, that's pretty profitable M&A. Right now, I don't see Jamie going out and overpaying for some of the acquisition targets that are out there. Um, if they were to do one, it would be more in asset management. They like those recurring fee businesses, and J.P. Morgan has been able to keep an asset management franchise since the crisis, unlike their competitor, Morgan Stanley, who kind of sold it off and has now had to rebuild it with really expensive acquisitions 10 years later. David Barnson, great to have some time with you, Chief Investment Officer of the Barnson Group.